When the enemy struck at Pearl Harbor, the whole of America's mighty productive machinery was thrown into high gear to place the country on a full war footing. The Congress quickly enacted legislation providing for the greatest construction program in the history of the world. Almost overnight, the Bureau of Yards and Docks of the Navy Department became a billion dollar concern. Recognizing the need for an organization of skilled workers to build advanced bases in active theaters of war, the Bureau of Yards and Docks obtained authority for the establishment of the first Naval Construction Battalion in charge of officers of the Civil Engineer Corps of the Navy. From this first battalion of 1,100 officers and men, the personnel of the CBs increased with the demands of war to 3,300, 10,000, 30,000, until at the present time, the total authorized strength is 222 active battalions with approximately 290,000 officers and men. It is difficult to put into words a full account of their services to the fighting forces, but I feel sure that this tour of CB activities as seen through the eyes of the motion picture camera will justify our confidence in this youngest member of the great Navy family whose motto, construimus batuimus, we build, we fight, is translated into action in the film you are about to see. These are Japanese planes. Their destination, Pearl Harbor, Midway, Cavite, Wake. Their purpose, treachery, destruction, war. These are civilian American workmen. Japan is at war with them, but they are not yet at war with Japan. All they had come for was to build things, put a little dough aside for the kids, and hope to get home for Christmas with the family. No, they were not at war. But Hirohito was. He had other plans for their Christmas. He was delivering his Christmas surprises early this season. these men wore navy blue and some wore overalls, but through the enemy bomb sites they all looked the same, just Americans. We learned many lessons that morning. One of them was the need for giving workmen at advanced bases military training. Civilians, for all their courage, lacked weapons or the ability to use them. If they were wounded, there was no government compensation. If they were captured, they were not entitled to treatment as prisoners of war. A new war presented new problems and a new solution. For out of the very fire that the Japs left behind them was forged a unique type of service organization, the Navy's Construction Battalion, or CBs, as they came to be called. America's answer to the need for skilled craftsmen ready to work under fire and to defend their work and themselves against enemy attack. All over the country, American workmen met this challenge. Machinists, carpenters, pipe fitters, steel workers, truck drivers, riggers, electricians, painters, welders, divers. From 17-year-old boys just out of trade school to gray-haired veterans of World War I. Swedes from Minnesota, Poles from the coal mines of Pennsylvania, Irish boys from Brooklyn, Scotch, English, Jews, Italians, Negroes, all races, colors, creeds, but all Americans. The skill that helped to build our country goes to war. Not in seven easy lessons, but in eight tough weeks, 
The Navy teaches the civilian craftsman to be a fighting builder. Thousands of individual workers, now forged into one great military organization, pass in review with their motorized weapons. Infused with the CB spirit, we build, we fight. Ready to build and defend advanced bases from the Arctic to the tropics, a new battalion leaves the training camp at the amazing rate of one every other day. American workmen, defenseless no longer, shoving off for battle stations. Destination for this CB battalion is strategic Dutch Harbor. The first big stepping stone on the road to Edak, Kiska, Hattu, an American reoccupation of the Aleutian chain, so vital to our offensive strategy in the North Pacific. Towering snow-capped mountains rising from the sea make this great arsenal of the North one of the most impressive sights in the Western Hemisphere. But the CBs haven't come to admire the scenery. They've come to change it. The iron jaws of the steam shovels bite into the fallen mountainside. Bulldozers, heavy tanks of construction, level roads where only walls of earth have stood before. In weather so cold that concrete has to be heated before it can be poured, the CBs are on the job, laying foundations for gun emplacements. Oil tanks, storehouses, concrete foundations on which victory will be built. The fine art of logistics, a big word for the big job of getting the right thing to the right place at the right time, made it necessary for the CBs to bring their own lumber yard with them. And lumber plus CBs quickly adds up to an imposing total of barracks, hospitals, shipyards, warehouses. A modern advanced base built to withstand the most savage attacks of nature as well as the enemy. A naval base thoroughly equipped to supply and serve the planes and ships that were gathering for a great offensive in the north. No longer would warships damaged in action have to creep back to Seattle for necessary repairs. When the CBs promised to have this destroyer out to sea in 36 hours, the skipper said it couldn't be done. But the CBs' answer became a famous slogan, can do. Thirty-six hours later, the destroyer was rejoining her task force, and a jubilant skipper was expressing his gratitude to the Seabees in an official commendation. In all my experience with shipyards, I have never seen such tireless energy. In spite of suggestions that the Seabees be relieved for rest, many of them worked thirty-six hours straight until the job was done. That's how the Seabees became a legend in the Aleutian. That's how victory was made inevitable at Atu. If you think of the Aleutians as an arm reaching out into the Pacific, the tip of the index finger pointing toward Japan is Atu. Cold, bleak, and forbidding, Atu had been a forgotten and unwanted island until it suddenly sprang into the headlines as a Japanese beachhead threatening the security of the Western Hemisphere. While our heavy artillery pound Jap positions within earshot of the beach, the CBs go into action on the construction front.
Today's beachhead becomes tomorrow's naval base. And coal is the sustenance upon which a naval base feeds and grows strong. Whether it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting or hand-to-hand -hand unloading, CB stevedores know their job. Like a line of ants, and just as tireless, they carry their heavy load across the barren slopes and valleys close behind the battle line. Huddled around the fire of their first pitched camp, it's a warming thought to realize that this desolate corner of the world is their own little piece of America. But the CBs are practical guys who like their warming chow along with their warming thoughts. And hot beans and a cup of java hit the spot on these sub-zero mornings when there's a day's work ahead to be finished by noon. With rifles on their backs or close at hand in case of enemy attack, they throw up temporary barracks. But materials for permanent quarters are on their way. 50 miles of tar paper. And buildings shipped in prefabricated sections that fit together like parts of a jigsaw puzzle. But a puzzle that CBs solve with lightning speed. For working in perfect teamwork, they shave a few precious minutes off their own record for setting up this unit. A good-sized, modern, and substantial hospital in five hours. In the States, gas stations may be opening late and closing early, but the Attu service station does business 24 hours a day. Transforming this barren little island into a flourishing base was a 24-hour-a-day job, or as the Seabees like to put it, a 36-hour-a-day job. But a job that was done, and finished in less time than the most optimistic American had hoped, or the most pessimistic Jap had feared. With the Aleutian chain anchored at one end by Dutch Harbor and on the other by Attu, the enemy holding out on Kiska found himself hopelessly cut off from his source of supplies. But thoughtful Americans who like to read behind the headlines, the headline Yanks retake Attu had become Seabees consolidate Attu. With the Aleutians back in American hands, hands that not only fired accurately, but built swiftly, the finger pointing toward Japan clenched into a fist that could strike a direct and punishing blow at the enemy's heart. From other points in the Pacific, the left hook was being planned. The Seabees put Midway back on the map. At Pearl Harbor, officers of the Civil Engineer Corps assisted in the salvaging of ships that had been irreparably lost, according to the Japanese press. A strange name, the Far Off Solomons, became a household word. Guadalcanal. At Guadalcanal, the Marines add a new verse to a famous song. The Marines sing a fighting song but their most extravagant words were an understatement at Guadalcanal. Yes, when you say Guadalcanal, you say Marines. But those Marines will be the first to tell you that if they made history at Guadal, those Seabees working and fighting shoulder to shoulder with them made something more tangible than history. They made a thriving base out of the flaming wreckage that was left after Johnny Marine had proved his point to Mr. Tojo that this island was too small for the two of them. With possession of Henderson Field, conclusion jumpers were congratulating each other on our domination of the South Pacific. For after all, wasn't Henderson Field the key to the Solomons? Yes, we had wrested a key from the Japs that was going to open some mighty important doors. But before that key could turn a single lock, it was badly in need of repair. The Seabees, digging into that airfield with the same fighting spirit as the Marines had hit the beach, repaired 53 shell and bomb craters in 48 hours. That would be a record in any league, but the Seabees hung up their record under fire.
fellow who got this one was a ship fitter first class, but he seems to be a first class gunner too. When Congressman Moss of Minnesota saw the CBs in action at Grottle, he reported, when Jap attacks were made, I saw CBs working on Henderson Field drop their tools, pick up their rifles, and fight side by side with the Marines. When the attack was over, the CBs put down their guns, picked up their tools, and calmly went back to work again. Just in time to fight off the enemy's most desperate counterattack, our fighter planes were able to use the runway. But the CBs didn't stop for any bows. They knew it was their job to put throttle on the offensive. Widen the field. Lengthen the runway. Place the fill. Grade the surface. Level it off. Make it navigable, not only for fighter planes, but for flying fortresses. In so short a time that even the slant eyes of the enemy opened wide, the field is ready. And as the first bomber takes off on its mission of softening up enemy bases for the landing operations ahead, the CBs win a two-fisted tribute from a two-fisted Marine, Lieutenant General Vandergrift, who said, I don't know how we would have gotten into the air without the CBs. The spectacular speed with which bombing operations got underway from Henderson Field played havoc with the Japanese timetable of conquest in the Solomon. Bases from which the enemy planned great offensives found themselves desperately on the defensive. Every day, our bombers were carrying the mail to Munda, Kolombangara, and Bougainville, the mail that contained nothing but bad news for Hirohito. If the Japs were to regain their initiative in this theater, their rising sun had to go up over Henderson Field again. This was the aim of the powerful enemy fleet, which sought to pierce our naval defense of Guadalcanal. These were making routine repairs on this carrier when she received orders to put to sea immediately to check the enemy counterattack. How those CBs stayed on the job through the critical sea battle that followed is a story that construction men will still be talking about when this war is safely bound between the covers of history. become synonymous with battle stations, as the CB motto, we build, we fight, is written in the blood and fire of an unforgettable moment at sea. When the last bomber was fought off, the last tongue of flame smothered out, she was a battered ship, a badly crippled ship, but thanks to our fighting builders, a ship that lived to fight and strike again. From skipper to ordinary seaman, every man aboard had played over his head. And for those 75 CBs, Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr., commander of the South Pacific area, had a special word of praise. Your commander wishes to express to the men of the construction battalion his appreciation for the services rendered by you in effecting emergency repairs during action against the enemy. I hereby commend them for their willingness, zeal, and capability. The CBs can do. The control of air 
and sea approaches to Guadalcanal, our forces were ready to fan out through the Solomons in quest of new bases from which warships could be supplied, from which land-based fighters and bombers could carry the battle to Salamaua, Rabaul, and the other strategic names that headline today's reports and will headline tomorrow's victories. Halfway between Guadalcanal and the enemy stronghold at Bougainville, Rendova was just another South Pacific jungle until the Japs made it an important stopping off place on our itinerary. D-Day, H-Hour at Rendova. The same clammy mist that concealed our landing operations from the enemy might also be concealing Jap snipers and machine gun nests waiting for us in the park. Army, Marine, and CB teamwork take another beachhead. Advanced scouts move inland, hunting the big game that stalks this jungle, hunting Japs. The planes flying low and the jungle fighting are better for the newsreels, but the backbone of invasion is supplies. And throwing up an air umbrella to cover those supplies before enemy planes can blast them from the beach. CBs look at a fire, they see more than smoke and flame. They see construction to be restored, defenses replaced, metal to be salvaged, dressing stations set up. But not all the CBs saw these things in the fire on the beach at Rendova. Not all the CBs will come back from Rendova. has promised them a warrior's heaven. And our boys would rather have them there than on the island of Rendova. Now that the beachhead has been secured, whale-like LSTs slide their bows up on the beach and begin to pour forth from their cavernous bellies the heavy equipment with which the CBs will transform this primitive outpost into another powerful base. Heavy trucks churn their way through the mud and undergrowth. And if they bog down, there's always a good old bulldozer, as versatile as a CB himself, to come to the rescue. Another favorite with the newsreels is the big gun blasting enemy positions. Less familiar is the back-breaking job that must be done before that gun is ready to go to work, like some giant prehistoric beast. The 155 lumbers through the jungle, guided by CBs to the place where it can do the most good, shelling the vital Japanese stronghold on nearby Munda Point. Munda. Once a tropical paradise on a blue lagoon, then a threatening enemy base. Now, a desolate graveyard of dead trees. Dead plains. Dead Japanese ambitions. And dead Japanese soldiers. Even the Munda landing strip is dead, with gaping shell holes in its side. But wherever the sea bees land, the odor of death is quickly overcome. For they work a new kind of magic in the tropics that brings dead island bases back to life again. But their magic has a simple formula, one part sweat and one part know-how. 
the CB word for getting materials where you can find them. In this case, tropical coral to surface the shell pot landing strip. Imperative that landing strip be ready as soon as possible. That was the message from headquarters. At Munda, the impossible, what even Air Corps authorities considered impossible, the Seabees accomplished in five days. On the fifth day, the CBs receive an unexpected bonus for their overtime. A fighter pilot contemplating a crash landing for his disabled Corsair spots their handiwork in the nick of time and sets her down hard but safely on the coral strip. wordless but eloquent tribute to the CB. The roar of powerful engines, the din of air traffic, incorporates Munda into the intricate network of allied bases in the South Pacific. Munda has risen from the dead. Nature launches her own offensive in the Solomons. Rainwater becomes runaway rivers, turning Quonset huts into flooded islands. Roads which the sea bees cleared in surface are swallowed in mud breeding ground for a malignant enemy even more deadly and treacherous than the Jap. This enemy, sighted in the microscope, the Anopheles mosquito, strikes silently behind the lines with a devastating weapon, malaria. The one fear in the minds of brave men, for it has decimated combat forces and postponed military offensives. A tragic toll of American lives, has been taken in the struggle against this insect army in the tropics. But the fight for life goes on. The shock troops of insecticides slog into muddy action. Under the supervision of the Medical High Command, the CBs launch a new offensive against the hidden enemy. Vigilant sentinels of the water supplies the CBs install filtering systems to prevent the enemy from sneaking into camp. For the streams are tropical sirens, beautiful, but full of death. But like our enemies, malaria fights a losing battle. The water runs pure, and the men grow strong. Vitality surges through the base again. American laughter. Healthy appetites. Spiritual strength. Another triumph in the CB's constructive conquest of the tropics as they go blasting their way through the South Pacific.
A new road in 72 hours. Twelve hundred concert huts in eight days. Another airfield, nine days from the falling of the first tree. And so the work goes on. Tree by tree and base by base, the CBs blaze the path that leads to Tokyo and final victory. How many headline readers appreciate the far-sighted construction program that lies behind those banner lines. Not in 1943, but in 1941. Not in southern Europe, but far off in an inconspicuous Scottish hamlet, began the great offensive on fortress Europe that is so rapidly gathering momentum today. Here the Seabees, under the very nose of the Luftwaffe, completed the base from which Anglo-American combined operations launched its initial drive in the European theater. Before the Navy's builders arrived, there was nothing here but an ancient fishing pier. 2,400 feet of ocean-going docks had to be constructed on the Clyde to accommodate our invasion forces, shoving off for their African adventure. As the rhythm of invasion quickened, the tempo of construction kept pace. At Oran, the causeways that were to play so decisive a part in the invasion of Sicily were assembled and tested. Before Brazette could play the vital role the high command had assigned to it, every dock had to be restored. Every scuttled Axis ship clogging the harbor had to be raised. Now the curtain was rising on the big show. for Sicily, the largest armada the world had ever seen. While the democratic people of the world held their breath, more than 2,000 vessels labored through angry seas to bring the war to Mussolini's doorstep. invasion style. Ships that carry their own portable docks. An innovation in landing operations that was originated and developed by the Civil Engineer Corps before the outbreak of the war receives its baptism in fire. Not even the Sailor's Bible, the Blue Jackets Manual, can tell them how to secure the heavy pontoons that form the causeway from which the LST's equipment is unloaded when the shore is too shallow for beach landing. For these CBs are adding a new page to the handbook of seamanship. As coolly and efficiently as if this were just another practice landing at Norfolk Bay, our amphibious forces barge in on Signora Mussolini. that had become routine in trial landings is a severe test of courage and skill as the causeway cut loose from the LST in a choppy surf sweeps in to shore on its own momentum. Conqueror of Arctic wastes and Solomon jungles finds itself another job. The bridge from ship to shore stands firm. The first cat rolls down the runway. The beach has been occupied without incident, except for an unexpected offer from a group of Italian defenders who wish to help with the unloading. 
that Herman Goering's dive bombers proved less hospitable. But if one LST is lost, dozens pour forth their devastating cargo, and the rumbling of heavy equipment across the causeways is the thunder before the storm that is soon to sweep fascism out of Italy. minutes to completely unload the staggering amount of supplies and equipment packed into every LST. Another record for the CB. Another reason why our invasion technique electrified the world. First to hit the beach and the last to leave, the Seabees are the cleanup men who salvage the wrecked ships and splintered causeways that are left in the wake of every invasion. This is beachcombing on a grand scale, for putting twisted steel and charred wood back to work again saves millions of dollars for Uncle Sam. Our motorized divisions roll along the main streets of Sicilian towns as safely as they cross the pontoon causeways. With Sicily secured as an alive base, a new D-Day looms up, the most daring and significant D-Day of World War II, the first Allied invasion of Fortress Europe. Now plans so carefully laid at the Casablanca conference months before are ready to be translated into violent and victorious reality. As they approached the coast of Italy, they were constantly meeting up with other convoys until the sea was completely covered with ships converging through the smoke screen on the Bay of Salerno. LSTs were loaded with bulldozers, tractors, and other CB as well as infantry equipment. The sea was calm and beautiful. But that was only the low before the storm, the most terrible man-made storm that was ever seen. Commandos, Rangers, and Seabees in the first wave were a perfect target for Nazi artillery, firing on them from the hills. But they held on. Sudden death was in the air and hidden in the sea. One of the first pontoons dropped over the side hit a mine before it could leave the LST. There were 35 Seabees on that pontoon. A bathing beach where fun-loving Italians used to sun themselves in peaceful days was soaked in blood. When you're in the spot our boys were in that night, it helps to feel that gun in your hand and to know you can return blow for blow. But those CBs responsible for setting up the beachheads, marking off the spaces for the LSTs and LCIs to come in, and directing the traffic that had to drive onto the beach in the face of that terrible enemy fire, they just had to stand there and take it. The CBs fought every chance they got, but there were thousands to do the fighting, and not enough to do those dirty jobs on the beach 
without which our forces would never get ashore. Cutting through the wreckage of trucks and tanks that had been crushed by German firepower into a wall of twisted molten metal, the bulldozers cleared the way for powerful General Sherman. While the battle raged, the CBs threw up impromptu storage houses for ammunition and equipment, and dressing stations for the wounded, where men who would have fled to death could be treated in time to bring them back to life and to their homes again. First inch by inch, then foot by foot, and finally yard by yard, our troops fought their way up the beach, now littered with broken machines and broken men. While the Seabees, with weary muscles but iron wills, went on unloading supplies until that bloody beachhead began to look like a naval landing base. There has seldom been so much courage in one place as on that beach at Salerno, from the lowest buck private to General Clark. But the Seabees were the unsung heroes of Salerno. And as the armies of democracy drive north on the road to Naples, Rome, and further on, Berlin, every man who took his chances on the shore that night could tell you, if we ever go into action as hot as those bloody days of Salerno, I hope to God the sea bees are there with us. There are great works ahead for the sea bees. The nation is building for victory. And no matter what the difficulties involved, we must and will obtain it. There is a place in the CBs for every fighting and working American, regardless of race, creed, or color, who has a stout heart, able hands, and the will to win. We have shown you in part some of the things accomplished by the CBs. We are proud of them. We look to the future with complete confidence in our ability to perform all those tasks which may be imposed upon us by our Commander-in-Chief. With that spirit, we will win. <laughs>